Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our podcast. I'm Kerian, and today I have with me Dr. Joyce Azam. Hello, Dr. Azam. How are you doing today? Hello, Kerian. I am good. I'm really good today. Thank you. That's great to hear. Um, as you all know, or as you all should know, Dr. Azam is a pro mountaineer and academic. She holds, I think, four or five graduate degrees. Can you correct me on that? <laughs> so, yeah. I, I even lost count. So depending on between the bachelor and the, the three master's degrees and, and the PhD. And the PhD. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so today we don't only want to focus on your uh, like athletic and mountaineering side. We also want to focus on the academic side because as you know, women are multifaceted. So we want to talk about everything. Um, so yeah, please um, tell me, what are you doing nowadays? You live in Lebanon, right? Yeah, so nowadays, after the, the, the blast of Beirut, um, I left to Dubai, you know, like seeking job and I started working. And I saw at some point I decided to move back. So I'm back to Lebanon since like the 22nd of October. And it's a very important date for me because it's like the day I decided I'm back and I want to, you know, like pursue my dream and I want to get back on my life. So like your question, what I'm doing today, I'm training, I'm training, I'm working, I'm doing a lot of things during my day. So yeah, I just like came from three hours training session and I had to change really fast. So I'm still wearing my, you know, like I'm wearing a jacket, but I'm wearing my, my training shorts <laughs> still on. So, yeah, so this is what I'm doing now. It's crazy, crazy schedule. Very interesting choice to move back to Lebanon now with everything happening, but I respect it. Um, so you're training to for the, your North and South Pole trekking that you're planning to go on or are you training for anything else? Yeah, yeah, I'm training for this big dream I have, uh, which is the Explorer's Grand Slam. It is about climbing the seven summits. I've already done that and reaching the two poles. And I'm training for the long distance version of this challenge. So there is only a 21 person around the world and three women who accomplished this Explorer's Grand Slam, this big challenge in the long distance version. And this is my goal. It's sounds crazy for many but for me it sounds super exciting <laughs> and uh, it needs a lot a lot of training discipline you know like putting all the hard work so I can enjoy my expedition yeah I'm sure but I mean you climbed the seven summits so I feel like at this point I think you're ready <laughs> after all this training um when do you think you're gonna embark start the journey like to actually go on the trip so I, I was wishing to be able to go for the North Pole this year in April. This is the first step, but I couldn't yet get the sponsor. So I am going for the South Pole. So it's okay. I'm, you know, like you always, ha I have always a plan B, C, D, E, F. This is, this is how I made it happen before because you, like, it's normal to get always a no when you ask for something. Like I prepare for the no more than the yes and I work hard to get a yes. And one is to get the yes, you know, we go. So now I am working towards the South Pole, which is like the big uh, achievement because in the North Pole, I will um, traverse a hundred kilometers, but in the South Pole, this is where is the long distance. I'm gonna traverse 1,130 kilometers, which is, uh, like uh, crossing for two months around 30 to 40 kilometers per day in, the, in, the, in, in Antarctica. I mean, in like a, a freezing cold of m between minus 20 to minus 70, setting up the tent, cooking for myself, melting the ice, preparing everything. So it's, it's, a, it's a pretty intense and, uh, and hard challenge, but I am, you know, like doing everything to get ready for it. I can't imagine braving all these temperatures and the terrain and the weather for so long on, on like on foot. So like, you know, when you talk about these things, 
it's kind of hard to visualize it but then I was looking at pictures and it's insane like those are blocks of ice that you're just hiking on and it's like it continues to amaze me every time I look it up so um obviously good luck and we all believe that you can do it so I think that counts for something right um, yeah I mean thank you I need all the luck for everyone even listening please send me good luck yeah <laughs> you know, we're on, anywhere on any platform Instagram Facebook Twitter anywhere I would love your messages because I really need every bit of luck and every bit of hard work Karin because it doesn't happen yeah, without you know putting the right um amount of time and and hard work and I learned this I've been doing this for the past 10 years as you know like elite mountaineer and 16 years as a training to prepare my body to do such really hard um you know like challenges and the same time how I see this ice I see it like you know like this this landscape it, it really makes me excited and happy from inside I I really I'm longing to be in Antarctica you know what I mean this is how I feel from inside about uh these big uh, i mean these like amazing places actually yeah i think there is some sort of romance to it when you look at it very well i think you have to be in love with it to brave it all uh, um totally. speaking of to let our listeners know so you started when did you start mountaineering exactly and what drew you to the sport because you said once that you in an interview you said that you first you were you went hiking but then your hypermobility kind of affected it and you thought that you why couldn't you walk and etc like can you talk about that a bit yeah um so you know you you mentioned romance and for me love is is, is something essential and my first love was the lebanese mountains and you know like now i'm back and i'm training in the lebanese mountains and this is where I discovered my passion. This is where I discovered that I can climb. I can walk a mountain. I can hike. I, I can do it because coming f- like from like a body or I was born with this body with a hypermobility syndrome. It's a syndrome. I, I cannot get rid of it. Uh, like today we were training specifically to empower my limitation. So my body you know, I was born with this limitation. I don't want to say normal or not. No, I don't like to use these words. I'm against them. And, and I'm, I'm different. And when I saw this limitation, which is like my knees, especially in the knees, right? Uh, this joint is hyper. There's a hyper mobility, hyper flex. So it goes backward. And, and by clicking backward, I cannot like, um, I don't know, my body would not let me uh, go down steep you know, like downhill, especially in the downhill. I remember once I was climbing in 2009 Mont Blanc in uh, in France, the Alps, and I had to go back the whole way backward, going backward because I couldn't, you know, face the downhill because my knees would click backward and it was so hurtful. And, you know, with my body, with my body, I am not made to climb mountains. I'm not made to be athletic as I decided to be. And when I met the Lebanese mountains back in 2005, this was the first meeting, I was like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. I mean, I didn't know of it existing. I didn't know that we have these beautiful mountains, Ernita Sauda, Samin, Amzad. I mean, these are like Jabal el you know, Mount Hermon. It's, I mean, it's for me, it was ecstatic. And not just that, the first time I trained, I remember around, uh, I mean, 2005, I started hiking in the summer. I didn't really have like an idea. And then I started hiking more and more. And in May 2007, I stood on top of Lebanon, or in the 3,088 meters. And yeah. I will tell you, Karin, the feeling I felt that moment, I felt achieved from inside because I was training for months. And remember, remember my body. Remember that I come from this limitation where it creates obstacles for me. So I cannot do what someone who doesn't have the syndrome can, you know, easily. 
such as balance, such as coordination, such as stability on a rock. So for me, it's like I don't have a balance because of this instability I have in my knees. And it, it was really hard. But the moment I stood on top of Lebanon in May 20, uh, 2007, like I felt a sense of achievement from inside. And it was the first time as joy, I felt strong. Because I usually, I always ha was seen as a young um, adult or as, as a, I mean, as a young person, as a child, as very weak. I mean, they would call me in, in Lebanese, not the stable one, you know, because of my syndrome, I would stand in a very, um, you know, like funny way for many. And I was, you know, like, um, it was hurtful for me when I was at school I was bullied even my friends they convinced me uh, at school when I was around 12 that I'm an alien and um, I was you know waiting for the spaceship to to take me to to, to my homeland somewhere outside so the man. World. <laughs> and and look it's now I mean, I can get it, but back then it really created a lot of uh, dark uh, moments in my life where I really, as I was very young, I decided, you know, like I had suicidal attempts because I just didn't like my body. I didn't like, because, you know, I wasn't accepted. Yeah. And that's why I, I worked and I'm still working with, you know, young people in Lebanon, especially at schools and, you know, talking about this. We are different and we can do whatever we want, even if we have our lim limitations. This is very important for me. But I mean, just, uh, you know, you need to cut me because I love to, oh, no, <laughs> this is to great. explain and uh, <laughs> to, tell, uh, to tell details. But anyway, uh, this was the start, Lebanese mountain. And then because I was studying at the Lebanese University architecture, I finished in 2008. So uh, and then I had this uh, always this dream to go to Italy and study in Italy architecture, like a master degree or something. I didn't know really what. But I wanted to do something in Italy and learn Italian and uh, drink cappuccino and eat pizza and eat pasta and, you know, and, and uh, date an Italian guy. And this, this all was my dreams around Italy. And I did. I did do all of that uh, because I was applying for scholarships. I, I didn't have the, the means or my parents. We are five children. I'm number four. We come from, you know, like a modest family. And my parents said we can never afford, you know, like even I studied at the Lebanese University in, uh, in Lebanon. So for sure they couldn't afford a private school or anything. So I got the scholarship. And when I went to Italy, I was closer to the Alps. And this is where I learned like high altitude climbing you know like it's it's a different concept it's not hiking it's where you you start using the ice axe the crampons you start at that you know acclimatizing your body to high altitude which is above 3000 meters you start experiencing high altitude and you, you know there's lack of oxygen you don't feel uh, like you feel more fatigued so you need to you let your body learn this and start adapting and acclimatizing with this. And this is, was my, my school, let's say, you know? So I started in Lebanon, I went to school re literally in Europe, but my, the Alps were another school for me in mountaineering. And in 2009, uh, I climbed my first 4,000 meters in the Alps. And this was the start of a career that I wasn't, you know, expecting or choosing or thinking about. But this was the start of my um, mountaineering career. That's that's great. Wait, so this was in 2009, the first yeah. high one. So when did yeah. you start the Seven Summit Challenge? In what year? I didn't start until 2000, uh, 2012. So between 2009 and 2012, I was training for a big expedition. Right. What was which what was the first mountain that you climbed? Four 
for the challenge. Hello. Okay, super. Uh, yeah, I was asking, what was which of the seven summits was the first one that you took on in 2012? You said. So in 2012, I started the seven summits with Aconcagua, which is the highest mountain in um, South America. Yeah, uh, but uh, I, I, I failed. I, I couldn't get to the summit. And it was my first mountain back in uh, February 20, January 2012. Um, and then my first mountain that I succeeded um, in, in getting to the top is Elbrus, which is the highest in, in Europe. Um, at 5,642 uh, in Russia, and it was um, it was really not super super technical, and I I mean uh, it took us like 10, 10 days more or less to get there to get to the top and back. Um, but one idea I want to share with you and everyone listening that. Uh, Aconcagua was a, a very important phase of learning. You know, it was a learning experience for me because I spent around 18 days on the mountain and it was the first time I go into uh, an experience of long expeditions, high altitude. The first time my body would hit 5,000, 6,000 meters. And it was really um, interesting to experience this. And as I always, you know, share with the, especially the, the 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 students in Lebanon and around the world through my uh, talks, I say I didn't fail, you know, because I don't really believe in failure. And fail is, uh, it, it, you know, it stands for first attempt in learning. You know, F for first, A for attempt in, and L for learning. And and be, because after five years. In 2017, I climbed Aconcagua again, not, not guided, just with my friend. We had to climb, like we climbed all like the mountain up and down with no guide. So we had to set our tent to be self-sufficient. And it's a different and it's it's much harder way to climb a mountain because maybe not everyone is familiar how these expeditions are, you know, like planned and, and done, but there's like a a guide that would prepare the, the, the journey for you, the expedition, and, uh, and they would decide for you when to stop. They would look up the weather, the conditions, when to move, to do a move between a camp to another. And we're talking about like a 20 day, 30 uh, day expedition, which is a long time. And these decisions would, or you can like even lose your life. This is the level of the decision. And, and um, so it's about also learning leadership and when to decide to move from camp to camp or to go to the summit and looking at the, so there's a lot of components more than, you know, to, to deal with when you are with no guide. Um, if you, you know, there's uh, this difference and I did it and I succeeded in climbing up and down and, you know, and this is, um, this is how I learned, um, to to accept um, like to accept when you when you don't get what what you want, just to accept the experience, learn from it, and keep going forward. You know, like to never stop. This is what I learned from Alconcagua. Yeah, but that's interesting though. Why did you decide to do it without a guide? Like, what compelled you? Um, because I was ready for it. So we're talking 2012, 2017, there's like 30 mountains between them. I know the mountain, I've climbed it before and I was ready for it. I was, I wanted to test myself in doing more. So what, when you go with a guide, uh, you have your water. So just to give you an idea, Karin, when you are on these mountains, you don't have water. So you need to melt the ice. And for one liter of water to drink and, you know, on high altitude, 
you, you get dehydrated, so you need to drink a minimum of three, uh, four liters, four liters, four to five. You know, you can drink three, you will survive, but it's better to drink four. And every liter would take like two hours to melt it, to oh, make yeah. it drinkable, to clean it. So you bring the ice and you sit uh, and, and you just, even sometimes you are so tired because you just, arrived with 25 kilograms on your back you know the backpack climbing up for five six hours and then you arrive to the camp you need to set the tent you need to you know set your stuff inside the sleeping bag the mattress so all these details it takes a lot of time and then on top of that you need to think about how you're gonna eat and how you're gonna drink so with the guide you don't think about the eat and because they you know they get paid to um prepare the logistics and in between also it was kind of a, a little bit shortage on on the budget so for me it's like yeah if i i can do it i can also save some money so i can do more expeditions and you know achieve my my um seven summits so it was a learning experience plus you know uh, this other stuff uh wow uh so whenever you mentioned like a friend, do you usually have a team with you? Is there like one stable team that goes around with you whenever you go on these, uh, you know, climbs? Do you have like a team? So, so as, a, as a Lebanese athlete, I'm not getting to the woman part yet, but as a Lebanese athlete, we really suffer um to because nobody would acknowledge that it's a career there's time you need to spend to do these um big expeditions uh, in training and preparation and you need a team around you so i i think i'm one of the the or i created my luck i don't know if i'm lucky or i created my luck because what i did i reached out to people that they would train me or they would help me out in my training because before going to the expedition, you need a team here. You need a team in Lebanon to, to, to get you to prepare mentally and physically for your big expedition. And maybe, I mean, I got some, a lot of those uh, in my team, they, they are, you know, they helped me for free, uh, honestly, because I didn't have the budget because it costs a lot to, to, to pay for all these um, team members. And on the mountain, I would join, um, uh, other than Aconcagua, how I did it with no guide, with a friend, I would usually join a team of other mountaineers as a guide. Um, and, uh, you know, I meet them most of the time, the first time on the mountain there. And um, we need to share sometimes, not sometimes, always a tent. And we need to share these days. And it's really interesting because I don't know you, but I'm going to share with you a very intimate moment of, of uh, you know, like uh, mentally it, it hits you sometimes on the mountain, especially all these days, like in, on Everest, 57 days, 57 days on the mountain, like, you know, like working hard to get um, to your goal. And sometimes you feel down. Sometimes you feel doubt. Sometimes you need... Um, and sometimes you just, as a human being, you don't get along with the other person. So, <laughs> so it's like pretty uh, interesting um, experiences I've got around the world um, with different teams and different people. But I'm blessed that I met all these beautiful people, you know, like uh, and different cultures. And uh, they made me also, you know, visit their, their uh, countries. And so it's, you know, there, there, there's these um, different uh, shapes of, uh, of experiences you can get uh, through these big expeditions around the world. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, I don't think we talk a lot about, you know, the social needs that you need to like, you know, meet when you're, because I don't like, there's one thing like climbing a mountain, but there's also like this feeling of dread and loneliness. And I feel like you need to have someone there to like, even if you don't know them, I think it's better than being alone, you know, like just for your mental health, at least. Cause like, I can't imagine well, it. Well, for me, it's very personal, Kathleen, very personal, depending on your character and depending how you also 
teach yourself you know there is a learning process before going so i always trained alone i train alone i have my coach i have my plan but i do my training alone i spend a lot of hours alone in the mountains so to prepare for everest and vincent i was living in the cedars at his area in lebanon but because it's the highest you know i can live at 2000 meters and it's really good as a preparation for an athlete or for a mountaineer and then i can climb up to 3000 meters it's the perfect condition so i was living there for i don't know like every time more or less for six months seven months four months on my own alone my parents or my friends would come in the weekend to visit me and sometimes they don't so one time i spent 20 days not speaking to anyone so i i am this person and i love it and and i have always i'm super busy and i have a lot of things to do and a lot of things to write and a lot of things to read and a lot of things to listen to so you know like uh, i don't know i mean um i don't mind uh, climbing a mountain on my own uh, although i'm a believer that happiness um, is not real you know isn't real if uh, it's not un unless it's shared you know a coating into the wild uh, movie <laughs> but i believe in that and i love it but also at the same time it's part of experiencing nature and especially mountaineering you need to learn to be alone and and it's not loneliness i repeat it's not loneliness for me it's just you enjoy being with yourself. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. I think that's that's a good mindset to have going into it. Uh, speaking of aloneness, as opposed to loneliness, did you, um, during the pandemic, you know, lockdowns, initial lockdowns in 2020 and 2021, what did you do? Like, did you pause mountaineering? Did you pause training? Or did you continue? And like, did you do it by yourself? Like, what happened there? Actually, uh, this is where I kept the dream alive. So for a mountaineer, I was like at first in Beirut and before the complete lockdown, because remember, like end of March 2020, we had like a complete lockdown in the entire country. So before just like maybe two days before the lockdown, I took everything and moved to uh, the Cedars. It's where I always stay. I, it's something uh, familiar. And I stayed on my own and literally on my own, like literally with no contact. But in the same time, I had this opportunity to be in nature and to walk the mountains and to climb and to ski because at that moment there was like still in March and April, I really enjoyed the snow uh, in the Cedars area because I have my own uh, skis, you know, with the skin, the backcountry skiing. So I didn't need the lift because everything was, you know, like um, uh, closed and you don't have the ski lift open or anything. But I would go climb and do my training. So this is where actually the, the dream of the Explorers Grand Slam or the two pole uh, started from, <laughs> from the lockdown. Because it's like, oh my God, this is an amazing time for me to train and to prepare. And actually, I have a, a report. Uh, I got interviewed by CNN Arabia about it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's about, you know, I learned, especially in Lebanon, I, grew, I was born during the war. Like, there's a lot of limitations, right? There's no privileges. Uh, even being a woman, it's another dimension of uh, uh, they literally don't give you the permission to dream as a society, as as a, as a family. Like it's like because you are a woman, why you want to climb Everest? But the, like now you you need to to think about having babies. Now you need to think about you know like having your own family. So this is the focus. Uh, so with all this challenges you you because i became overcoming all these challenges but this is what i meant i become became more and more and more resilient so covid and all these it's not the end of the world <laughs> you know and as a 
10 years, I, I learned to live on my own, to live with my own, uh, you know, world. So honestly, it's not like easy always, as, it's as always, you know, especially my mental health, it can put me down. It, 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 the, the doubt, my mind can bring a lot of doubt to my life and I feel like a failure and then I pull myself out and go to the outside or do a training and, you know, everything will be washed out and I will have a more of a positive uh, mindset. Uh, and this is actually, honestly, I will tell you why I love to go to the mountains in 2005 because I was uh, suffering from chronic depression. I would sit in my bed, especially, you know, I studied architecture and architecture, there's a lot of pressure on the students, like lots of, especially at the Lebanese University. And I was really like anxiety and depression was hitting me rock bottom. Like, and I remember um, that year in 2005, I would like stay in my bed for three, four days. And my mom didn't know what to do with that. Like she was really like, she didn't know. So she would like push me, like go out, go to your own university. But I literally, sometimes I would feel so down that I don't want to leave my bed. And then when the mountain came into my life and I was like, oh my God, I loved it. It's giving me a sense to my life. I'm, I'm feeling stronger. I'm feeling joy. And also it gave me this space where I, I really noticed this when I am not going to the mountains or not doing sports. When I sit with myself, I look, I think backward, which means what I didn't do well, you know, what I did wrong. And I start kind of punishing myself. But when I go to the mountains and especially like even today, I was at the gym doing my training. And this one hour when I'm focusing on my training, I just start thinking forward, oh, how I'm going to do this project or, or how I'm going to, you know, apply for this or how I'm going to get this sponsorship because now all my thinking is towards the sponsorship and how I'm going to pitch this person or, and how I can get to that person, who I can contact. And I start, you know, thinking about the presentation. So all my thinking is positive. So like today, especially through the pole to pole, I'm working on mental health, on well-being and how the mountain you know, like really, really helped me to keep my mental health in check and, and, and to keep um, myself in a, in a good place, you know, healthy also, healthy physically and specifically mentally. So this was the hook with the mountain. This was, I, you know, it's like, a, it's kind of a, a, the good obsession. You know, you get this obsession, but it's like really good and it maximized my life. I mean, I would never imagine my, myself uh, before meeting the mountains that I would be achieved this way, like doing a PhD, two master's degree, and the seven summits, traveling literally the seven continents of the world at the age of 34 years old. Like now I'm 37, but you know, I finished all that when I was 34. So it's like, I wouldn't, like if you ask Joyce when she was 15, she would say, I, I mean, you know, I didn't have even a dream when I was 15 or 16 or 17 or 18 or 19. I didn't have a dream. I didn't know what I want to do in my life. So it's really about uh, connecting to yourself. And the mountains gave me this space to connect with myself and to experience who am I. I think it's, I think uh, you've mentioned this once. I think like once you found something, that makes you feel mentally good, like hold on to it. Like whatever others may say, career goals wise, like if it's something that lights something inside of you, then you should go for it. You uh, And I, I believe that as well. Um, you've mentioned before the challenges of being a Lebanese athlete, but can you expound more on the challenges of being a female Lebanese athlete? Cause I feel like that's a whole other bout of challenges. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, look, when I started and I have this dream, oh my God, I want to do the seven summits. I can't do the seven summits because I started, you know, to be stronger and stronger in the mountain. And, you know, remember, I come from this person who always felt weak when I was a child or 
um, you know, like a adolescent, like my teenager is like not very interesting and uh, it was painful for me. So I didn't have this chance to, you know, feel strong. So at, at this point, when I decided to go for the, the seven summit, uh, I didn't think that I'm a woman. I, 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 as a Joyce, you know, but who made me think about it? First, my mom. My mom was like, Kune binet, you know, like in Lebanese, she would do this Kune binet. Every time she was, she see me like going out or, you know, coming back home from a long weekend in hiking or caving or, you know, like there's mud on my, um, you know, pants and stuff. She was like, this, you know, like you are a woman, you should be feminine. What are you wearing? You are doing, what, you know, and this is the first, you know, like, I was like, what? I mean, why? You know, in my head, like, why? And it was hurtful, you know, once she said, you look like a man, and it was really hurtful. And you know what I did as an answer to that? I did a pageant. I, I, <laughs> I signed up for a pageant, like uh, Miss Lebanon in Italy, something like that. And I was, and, and I wore, like, I had to learn how to wear these 20 centimeter high heels. I wanted to do the experience. And, but it was an answer for my mom that, it's not because I do this, I can't do that. I'm, I'm a super woman, I'm super feminine, and, but this is my dream, why not? Like, what is, what, like, why not, right? He said, and then my friend said, I'm crazy, and then the really mean, mean thing that you would hear about being a mountaineer, woman mountaineer, they would tell you this is a waste of time. And, and you know, like um, you, you, you think you are strong because it's kind of the idea of a woman and strong, they don't fit together. So it's like, even sometimes I, I had these, I experienced these um, uh, moments on the mountain. There is a man who, you know, who would not have uh, experience as, as I do. For example, I climbed, let's say 30 mountains around the world you know, above 4,000 meters, and he would fly, have climbed two mountains, let's say, three mountains, okay? And the experience is huge. People would listen to him, not to me. They would listen, even if what he's saying is wrong. Why? Because the idea of a guide or a mountaineer in the head of the society is embedded as a strong man, not a strong woman. So all this, I face a lot, like, especially if pitching sponsors, like, why do we need a, a woman to do this, like the first Lebanese woman to do the seven summits? We have the first Lebanese man already, it's enough. You know, like people thinking like that, like, what? Every country has a first man and the first woman. Why not Lebanon? You know, I was like, you know, so, so all this really, it was hard. Even like the struggle I, I felt, was harder than climbing the mountain, literally. And I had to deal with it. I had to accept it and I had to say, okay, I want to inspire change. And how you inspire change? By being a pioneer. And what a pioneer does is opening a trail. And opening trail, it takes much more effort. It takes much more time and it takes hard work. So, you know, what I'm saying now, I, I did it. But while doing it, it was really hard. And, and especially the interesting part is the community, the community that I know and I was also surrounded of men. They didn't like my uh, success. They didn't, uh, um, you know, like, uh, um, how to say, acknowledge my success. And this is very interesting to look at because when the, the men would be supportive until not all men, yeah, but some of them, until you are on like a higher level or you are doing more. And this is where there's a conflict. So all this wasn't easy, but I mean, you, you got to do what you got to do to make what your dream, you know, like I always say, it's my dream before being a record, before whatever it is, my dream. I wanted to travel the seven continents. I wanted to try all the food and I wanted to climb all these mountains. So, you know, like this is, uh, 
this is uh, the why at first? Um, so in addition to being a mountaineer, you're also an academic. As I've mentioned earlier, you do have a good number of degrees. So can you tell me about the transition period between these two careers and the struggles that come with it? Yeah, oh my God. That's a really good question, honestly, because I did, I mean, I was even, uh, how to say it, to express it, like I was hesitant, that's the word, hesitant, to tell people that I'm also an architect. Because there's one thing my mom would tell me, and I always talk about my mom because other people said it, but I'm just talking about the closest person to me, right? Like my mom, my mom would say, Joyce, you are a PhD, you are a doctor, doctor, how you are going to talk about mountains on television? <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like, it's like being a mountaineer is diminishing what a doctor is, you know, like, or, a, I mean, we're, yeah. we're talking like it's, it's a, it's a, having a PhD in architecture, um, it's, it's kind of put you in a position or a status in a society where you need to fit in and to, to do what it takes to do it. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I love what I did in, in my studies and, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm specialized in, the management and conservation of cultural and natural heritage sites. So my PhD is in the management of landscape and environment. And, and I love it. I love it. It's, it's also my passion. And at the same time, it gave me the opportunity to work on projects in the Lebanese mountains and other uh, mountains around the world to protect the mountains and conserve them. So it's, it's, it's going really along what I'm doing. Uh, in, in, you know, as a mountaineer also professionally. But doing the transition was one from one side on the society, how they, they understand you or they accept you because you are doing something new, you know. And the, on the other hand was like uh, economical, which means to do such a project, and remember, I'm a, I'm a self-made woman, so even my education, I had to get the, the scholarship uh, to afford it. And when I got to the Seven Summits, when you don't have a sponsor, what to do? How I can juggle between two careers? How I can um, have a full-time job and still training and pitching sponsors? Because it's a full-time, it's another full-time job. Like, Pitching a sponsor and getting your project funded, uh, creating um, like a communication plan for your project, like for the seven summits or for each mountain and having going on the media and talk like a media plan, interviews, radio, TV, all these, it takes a lot of work and being like, you know, me and myself, this is my team. It's hard. It's really, really hard to pull it in a way to, to, you know, to make it happen. So what I did, I was taking part-time jobs. When I decided I want to finish the seven summits between 2017 and 2019, I said, this is it. I'm going to dedicate time. So before that, between 2013 and 2017, I stopped doing the seven summits because I wanted to finish my PhD. I got a really good scholarship from Italy, La Sapienza. And I said, you know, Joyce, this is a priority for you. This is also your dream and you wanted to finish. And, and in these years, in 2015, my mom even convinced me to get married because I met a really uh, handsome Italian guy when I was in Rome. And she convinced me really to, to get married and, and to sell my stuff, like even to sell my equipment. She wanted really to get rid of the, the mountaineering of my life. And I, for sure, I mean, as I'm still single now, I didn't get married the Italian guy and I didn't sell my <laughs> my equipment, my mountaineering equipment, just for everybody to, to, to understand, like my crampons and my ice axe. And, and, and then, um, uh, so I, I just had like a blank moment <laughs> because I remembered everything in, uh, in Italy. Yeah, we were talking about uh, 
your life as an academic as well as a mountaineer. Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I was, I was saying that between 2013 and 2017, I just stopped. I didn't stop mountaineering. I would go during the weekend and because my life is based around, you know, mountaineering. So I would spend my holidays climbing a mountain. I kept on training in Italy. I kept everything between 2013 and 2017. But uh, I prioritized my, finishing my PhD. So I, I came back to Lebanon in 2017 from Rome. And I said, this is it. I want to finish my seven summits. This is the time for the seven summits. So what I did in this period, I, I took a part-time job uh, at Alba. I was teaching in a master's degree. And at the same time, I had the time to pitch the sponsors to train because I need around 22 hours per week just for my training, just for my training. So, uh, you know, juggling uh, these two careers is it's never easy. Still today, it's not easy. Today, like now, now, I'm still going through the same struggle. It didn't end, even if I have, you know, the title as the first Lebanese woman to climb the seven summits, but it's still the same because as an athlete, you're honestly, you're not rewarded. Uh, I mean, in, in especially, especially in Lebanon. And it's hard. It's really hard because you put a lot of effort and a lot of investment in it, um, and and uh, you need to figure it out how to get funded. You know, like for now, I would like I'm ready. I'm ready to go on all levels, mentally, psychologically, physically. I'm ready to go for the South Pole and the North, the North Pole. But what is really stopping me? <laughs> you know, figuring out how to get the money. I really need a lot, a lot of money uh, for these remote and big expeditions. So how to, uh, to to cover that? I need to figure it out. I need to find ways, especially in this economic crisis that we are all suffering. You know, like we, lo we lost a lot the last two years and a half, a lot. Like we lost people we love. We lost pieces of our home. We lost a piece of Lebanon. We lost our money in the banks, and I'm part of this. I lost, <laughs> I lost a lot. Like I was like the other day, like looking back, it's like this is crazy. Two years and a half. Yeah. And, you know, and and I have my ups and downs. I feel depressed sometimes, and and I learned one thing. There's only me. You know, I don't have someone to take me out of the bed, and and I need to take out myself from the bed and and say okay today what's gonna do the best i can and today is i go do my training go back you know find a way to find a new sponsor pitch that sponsor and do the work and tomorrow is another day you know and i'm consistent with that and thank god you know there's a sponsor coming in and the project gonna start in a few weeks you're gonna you know like know more and more about it we have campaigns around it and i'm gathering more and more people believing in me why because it starts from me you know everyone listening if you have a dream if you have something you want to achieve and and you know like other people think it's crazy because i heard it a lot and you know they made me think maybe i am i don't know like <laughs> like they make you think that you are doing something that is wrong sometimes also or a waste of time this is very mean a waste of time like how i'm wasting my time on doing something i love this is not a waste of time so please if you have a dream a dream be faithful to that dream protect it it's your dream and and nobody nobody on this earth should give you the permission to pursue it you will decide but on the other hand you have to put in the work you have to be consistent you have to be, to be determined and you have to not let go you know with the first no you get because a lot of people are gonna reject your idea because it's not like if you smile and you have a nice smile you get everything in this life you need you know to find the right people and 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 when you believe in yourself there's the magic happens there literally in my life you know i was like alone and then i was like wow 
this really successful person is believing in me and this other successful person is believing in me and you know and 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 i have a group of of uh, i call them my angels and people who even sometimes with one advice you know with one contact with one you know like they create your network they help you to move forward you know in your life yeah. forward not backwards so choose with who you want to sit choose with who you want to share your story choose with who with whom you want to share your dream honestly for a while i wasn't telling my parents about my dream because they would take me backward they didn't they were scared for sure i i feel them also they're scared like and their daughter is like i'm gonna go to everest and a lot of people died there so they wanted to stop me but i couldn't share with them my story or my dream sorry and you know how did they know that i'm going for everest how they they, they watched an interview on tv oh you didn't tell them beforehand so, i read once so that they, they told you while they you were there while well, it was on Aconcagua the first time they they called me and and I, I mean i called them from a satellite phone and i said mom forgive me please but i'm at the base camp and <laughs> i'm at 4400 meters i love you a lot just like think you know like pray for me and stuff so at that point she couldn't say anything i'm there i'm doing it yeah but before that she would stop me right like with all the nagging and 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 because i she's a mother i'm she's a parent and, and i understand you know there is fear in there and i understand where they come from so what i do i learn my lesson i would not share with them that before doing it because i'm a responsible person i'm taking care of myself and this is what i always say so you cannot like ask your parents for money you know ask their money and then rebel on them take care of yourself be responsible be be your own parent and then you can do that yeah just between brackets between for the people who would think yeah i'm going to you know do things that my mom and dad would not accept no it's not this way it's about taking care of your and and showing up with all this responsibility in the world you know like this is very important yeah that's that's all well and good and on that positive note uh i have one last question for you um to end on a positive note what's your favorite memory from your career from your journey till now like can you think of a single moment where you were like elated like this is it you know what's your favorite memory do you oh have oh my god i have i have a lot of good memories from all this like through all the obstacles and challenges and the struggle i mean standing on top of the world and especially this part it was like the summit ridge and when i arrived to the summit ridge we're talking on 8800 meters um and there's just a little bit to get to the top of the world just a little bit and it was just like you know when um uh, in french crepuscule it i think the dawn in english it's like just the start when the light is hitting yeah the, dawn. the sky the dawn and i remember the stars and this beautiful color of of blue uh, and then you know i was like you know arriving to the top of the world and it, i mean the joy i felt the fulfillment it's, it's not just the top of the world it meant for me an accomplishment of a dream of seven years you know like seven years of hard work and changing plans and creating a new opportunities and working and training and sweating and all this you know culminated with standing on top of the world and you know for the ones who saw the pictures i have from the top of the world you can see the joy i have in my you know you can see it in my eyes in, in and i took off my oxygen i was in an ecstatic place and um and that is an answer for everyone is doubting if it's worth it to put all all your th- this effort to make a dream happen yes it's worth it it's 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 worth every minute of uh, of hard work because it just the 
the sense of ach achievement and the fulfillment you experience or I experience is, um, and it's constant, you know, it just it, it stays inside of you. That's great. And I think that's probably one of the things that keeps you going, right? That, you know, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And then, yeah, I think that's very inspirational. Thank you so much for joining me today. And thank you for coming on to here. Um, I'm sure everyone appreciates it. And thanks again for participating with us in this podcast. And uh, yeah, everyone, thank you for listening. This has been Dr. Joyce Hazam, mountaineer and academic, who just bestowed us with so much wisdom. So thank you. <laughs> One second. Thank you. Thank you.